Matthew chapter 2, and I'm not sure how I'm going to follow those children. I won't keep you long this morning, I promise. I'm reading out of the New King James this morning. And Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Now after was Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and the scribes and people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod, when he secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child, and when you found him, bring back word to me, that I may come and worship him also. When they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Then, being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. Matthew starts off with, in the days of Herod, and I'm not sure if you know much of, of the history of Herod, but Herod was, a, his hands were bloodstains. He, he was truly, truly violent and truly an oppressor. It, it, some of my studies I've read that from this point to about two years prior, somewhere in there, he actually executed two of his own sons for treason. So when Matthew says in the days of Herod, he wants you to know right when this is taking place. It's taking, in, taking place in the middle of the dominion of a tyrannical king. The three wise men, and this was a fun little thing my wife and I got to do last night. If you go through your Bibles, we went through several translations. Wise men, the three wise men, over and over and over. And you have to go back to the Greek to see what is really going on in this text. And the Greek word is magios, which Matthew uses here, which means magi. They were like magicians, sorcerers. So some of us may believe that, that these wise men may have been Jewish folk from somewhere else and they came over here. But these magi were Gentiles. And they came from a long ways away. There's a couple different beliefs from where the magi came from. From Babylon or Persia. By the way, it was over a thousand miles one way as a crow flies. A thousand miles. There is no Southwest Airlines in this day. It's, it's a journey. It is truly a journey. So it took at least four months if they were coming from Babylon and more if what I believe they came from Persia. Has anybody ever been on a couple thousand mile journey? It, how about driving? Have you drove a couple thousand miles? Sister Carol, Cecilia, it, it could, I did it with my sister. We went 1,700 miles to Oklahoma, and she about wanted to choke me by the time we got there. But journeys get tough on you. They really do. So we know that these magi had to encounter weather. They had to encounter circumstances. The children, and thank you to Rita's family for leading us on the, the journey to Bethlehem, maybe they encountered robbers and little people hiding in corners and stuff on the way. But nonetheless, they journeyed. They, they went on a tremendous journey to meet the king. 
I want to tell you this morning that the journey to seek God and His will for your life is worth the effort. Life with Jesus is a beautiful journey. And up on the overhead, there's some brief information of something we're starting in the end of January. It's called the Disciples' Path and specifically the journey. And if you're available on Wednesday nights, we want you to come plug in and rediscover purpose for Christ in your life through the journey. We're going to get deep with one another. We are going to confess our sins to one another. We're going to find out how God's wired us. And we are going to hold each other accountable. We're going to bless each other and encourage each other. And watch one another grow in Christ Jesus as we journey with Him. Life in Christ is a journey. It's not, it's not a hocus pocus. You become to believe in Christ and now everything is honky dory. I don't want people to mislead you about the Christian life, that there is temptations. Later on, as you read in the book of Matthew, you'll see that Herod tried to snuff out the coming of our, kid, our king by eliminating all the two-year-olds and under in Bethlehem. That this world will try to snuff out your joy. And we need one another. And we need to journey with one another as we grow in Christ together. So the Magi came, and they must have come to Herod's temple or Herod's palace. I'm not sure where they came, but they came to Jerusalem. And they asked the question, where is he who is born king of the Jews? They wanted to find the king of the Jews for his sake. For a long time before this, Gentiles in the world at large believed in messianic prophecies, that a great king would rise out from the Jewish people. If we remember our Old Testament stories and how God has granted his people favor amongst the rulers of some Gentile and pagan nations. And we love these stories. We, we read them in our children's books. Joseph and Pharaoh. We all remember the story of Joseph. It was in Egypt. God granted Joseph favor Joseph wasn't silent. Joseph had influence in that empire. Nehemiah to Xerxes in Persia. God bless his people to get all the way up close to the leaders of kingdoms. Little K. We all love the story of Esther, King Ahasuerus, which was also in Persia. And God's influence through Esther in Persia. And then Daniel. We love the story of Daniel in the lion's den. But Daniel served under Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. And Daniel had specific prophecies. But these magi, I want to tell you, were, they, there's no CBN. There's no Fox News. You know, they didn't turn it on and say, hey, what are there, what's going on over there in, in Israel? What's going on in Jerusalem? That Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years before this, God spoke through his people and even out into pagan nations. And people understood that one day a great king was going to be born. Gentiles, which these magi are, believed that a great king was going to come out of Egypt. And they made this journey. Part of this magi, this magician, is they were astrologers. I'm not sure if astronomers or astrologers, which one's the right word, studying stars. Yep. So, uh, but how, why did they get up and go? They, get, they got up and went because for long, long periods of time, God has inserted his truths into the world that one day the Christ would come. They had influence. Joseph, Nehemiah, Esther, Daniel, those servants under other kings and pagan nations, they had influence. If you think you're not influencing someone this morning in your life, in your work, in your ministry, think again. You are influencing people. You have an impact on people. You may not realize it right now, but you do. 
God's word through his prophets and through his people and servants, through our Old Testament stories, testified of Christ and how he was to come. Notice in this particular story, the kids blessed us and read us this morning, at uh, the shepherds, as we read in Luke 2 last week, the angel came to them. No angel came to these people. They knew he was coming. In Daniel 7, verses 13 and 14, we read, I kept looking in the night vision, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like the Son of Man was coming. And he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. Daniel, speaking this, writing this, long before Christ was born, some people listened. Some people listened. Whatever other baggage they may have brought on, whatever they may have studied, philosophical thinkers, other monotheistic religions, uh, they came from, the Magi specifically came from what I believe is the Median, uh, which was influence and part of the people of Persia, and they still have this flame that's been burning for thousands of years. They won't let, they won't let it go out. But nonetheless, with all this baggage and all this belief system, God injected his truth through Daniel. And one of the things, if you watch Matthew when he writes, he most dominantly says, God through the prophet spoke. The fingerprints of the coming of Christ have been placed throughout creation since the beginning of time. People were looking for the coming of this great king. Some had their own expectations of what this may all look like, while others received him as he was. Some contended even with the scriptures to find life. Jesus told these people in John 5.39, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify of me. The second half of the second verse, when these magi show up and say, where is he who is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and we have come to worship him. Up on the overhead is the word used for worship in the New Testament. And it's a, there's a couple different renditions, proscu neo, proscu nine. And it's a very, very humbling word. And almost always it's associated with prostrating and falling down on your face before someone. We see this word used when Cornelius, for example, falls down before Peter, and Peter says, get, get up, I'm just a man, don't do this, don't do this, we worship God. And the Magi here say, where's this king? We came to worship him. If you're Herod and you're a jealous guy, are you going to like what's going on here? I, I, I don't think so. So a good question to ask ourselves from the lesson we can learn from the Magi is when we reflect on the manner in which we come to God, do we come to him with a list of expectations? Do we come to him for his open hand? Or do we come to him with a heart of genuine worship? A heart, if you can see on this overhead with the usage in the New Testament, that I go down to my knees to, to do obeisance to, to worship that I genuinely come open-hearted just to be in your presence. The Bible talks a lot about drawing near to God and Him drawing near to us. I truly believe when our hearts cry to Him is out of reverence and a heart of worship for who he is and what he's done. He lights the ends of our paths. He ignites hope in our hearts. And he brings strength to the inner being. As Luke records the story about the shepherds 
and now how they had come to see what God has done. If you remember last week's message, they, could, they must go see what God has done. I praise God for every one of you in here today and why you're here. My heart's prayer this morning for all of you in this building is that you're here for Jesus and that you draw closer to Him. Our, children, our children's program this morning was a beautiful thing. And Jesus is the reason we had this program. We come to get closer to Him. Verse 3 says, When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered the chief priests and the scribes and the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea. If you notice here, the Magi are inquiring. In Bethlehem of Judea. For thus it is written by the prophet, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people. The Cambridge Literal Translation here says, But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, Thou, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me he that is to be ruler in Israel. Some people think that this, this great king was born. How? Where can I see his kingdom now? Some struggle to find the beauty of the gospel and the work of God. The children were kind enough to read us the Beatitudes and the kingdom of God and how it's gone forth into the world. And is this king really reigning now? And I say he is. And I want to celebrate with a couple of slides on our overhead of our king's activity in the world. You can't see it too well. I'll read you the text. This is a picture it's from Uganda, and it's from a, a Christian missionary group called Wells for Life. And their mission statement is, is a Christian organization bringing clean water to rural Uganda by drilling wells and teaching the local community about sustainable hygiene and water supply. And the next one, Don, if you're a football fan in here today, how many of you watch football? We got lots of football fans. Tim Tebow's Foundation for Orphan Care and Outreach provides life essentials for abandoned and homeless orphans in seven countries. And I pulled this photo and that statement from their website. Tim Tebow is a man of God who has started this. And it, I believe it's that ministry alone has provided over 800 kids in five different countries with homes in the name of Christ Jesus. God is at work. Jesus is on his throne, and he's doing wonderful things. These are just two slides. Up on the overhead also is our church statements. Because we believe Jesus is king, we are a church where you find hope, belonging, and growth in Christ as we glorify God and extend his kingdom. And our vision is to see God transform our community as we strive to equip believers in Christ by digging deep, growing strong, and going forth with the gospel. Some of us are afraid of the word change sometimes. Change means, means things to us. Sometimes we don't like change. Our God is in the transformation business. Transforming His people from glory to glory. And we believe in this place that God can and will transform this community as each and every one of us come closer to Christ and we disciple others and grow them up in Christ Jesus, that God will transform this community. Back to my text. Sorry, squirrel. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, he determined from them what time the star appeared. And I, I won't get into all the dates and, and uh, controversy and struggle around, around the Lord's birth and the time this was. 
But Herod's inquiring of the Magi. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child, and when you, and when you have found him, bring back word to me, that I may go and worship him also. Yeah, right. That was not Herod's intention at all. How many of us live in town? I don't. Sorry, I put my hand up. I used to. Maybe I was there last night. That's why. But when, when there's rumor that something's going around in your neighborhood in the middle of the night, were you? Now, these magi, it says all of Jerusalem was concerned too. So Herod has a problem. He's got some people. How many wise men? The Bible doesn't say. Just, just clear it up. Three gifts. The Bible just says wise men came from the east. But he's got people, these magi, in, in the community spreading rumors that there's a king born. And he's already, already shook up in his head, already nervous. And now he has this. And what is going on in my community? When they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. Now they have their guide back. They've gone a thousand miles to Jerusalem, over a thousand miles. I don't know exactly. This is a long, long journey. And you could probably sense the tension in Jerusalem. And now they've got to travel to Bethlehem, and the star comes up. So, praise God, that's where I'm going. And it's only a few miles off. It could, I wouldn't know what to do if I traveled 1,000 miles to think that I had to go another 500. But there it is. So they're exceedingly joyful. And then when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with, his, with Mary, his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. As the Magi fell down in worship, we can see something extremely significant. This was not a palace. This was not Jerusalem. And this was not Herod. This was in a house, and this baby was a toddler, baby Jesus. And they fell down, in the same word again, proskineo, and they worshipped him. And the significance of what they brought, more than the gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, though those gifts are significant, was they laid their hearts at the feet of God when they bowed before him. They surrendered themselves. Most of the time when we travel, we're going to get something. And someone remind me if I'm going to travel again to a mall or something that I probably shouldn't. I I don't like traveling through town. It's not very fun. But we're going to get something. The gift they were receiving was simply the gift of having the privilege of being in the presence of the king the king that for hundreds of years, even from wherever these magi came from, that they knew was coming. It's why they made the journey. He was worth the journey just to see and be in his presence because Jesus is the gift. They left gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. It says, when they had opened their treasures, they presented to him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. There's a lot of speculation over what these are. But gold is definitely royalty. It was definitely an Eastern custom that you do not meet a king without gifts. And who gives a toddler incense? They did. Some believe it's prophetic that the frankincense and the myrrh were prophetic of Christ's divinity, of Christ's priesthood. 
wherever we're at on that spectrum, they were not going to leave without offering themselves in some of your Bible says homage and also offering a gift. Jesus is our great high priest. He came born of a virgin with a mission. Hebrews chapter 10 verses 11 through 18 says, and every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us. For after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. In conclusion this morning, if the wise men gave Jesus three gifts, I want to encourage you to offer God three as well. Your heart, because His will is to have your heart to Himself first. Out of this is where true love and mercy really flows into your life. Jesus said in Mark 12, 30, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and all your strength. This is the first commandment. The second gift I want to encourage you to offer him is your mind. Because the way you think and filter information in our current pressure, pressure cooker society is important. Paul gives us encouragement in Philippians 4, 8. He says, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, Whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are good report. If there's any virtue and if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. And thirdly, offer God your hands. Because loving your neighbor as yourself is truly what he calls each of us to do, practically and personally. Jesus went on to say, and the second, like it, is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Mark 12, 31. The wise men came to worship the one true king, and then they vanish. Never to be read about again in Scripture. You don't see him. This is when they show up, and then they vanish. I want you to know today, that if this is the last time you hear my voice, Jesus is the Son of God, and He laid down His life for you, that you may live. We celebrate the coming of our great King and High Priest in this Christmas season. The inscription that was attached to the cross matched the question of the Magi, King of the Jews. At the cross and through the resurrection, God has offered us the greatest gift of all, salvation in and through Christ Jesus. If you walk with Christ today, rejoice in your gift. If you don't know Jesus as Savior today, He can be received by faith this morning. Simple as receiving. I will stay up here for a while. If you need prayer afterwards, I'm going to ask Brother Sid to pray and close our service this morning.